and answers to questions, statements by ministers, items on the public business, and private members' motions. Before we begin though, let's try a parliamentary trivia question. True or false, any Commonwealth citizen 21 years or older who has been domiciled in Jamaica for the 12 months preceding an election may become a member of the House of Representatives if elected. Get the answer during this introduction to the lower house. On this sitting's agenda, the sectoral debate continues with Minister of Justice Deroy Chuck making his contribution. According to the Jamaica Information Service, time is allotted for the sectoral debates for two sittings per week over a six-week period following the close of the budget debate conducted at the start of the new fiscal year in April. Based on the standing orders, rules governing the Houses of Parliament, members entitled to speak during these debates are any minister and any member of the opposition selected by the leader of the opposition. According to the standing orders, no member is allowed to address the House or a committee of the whole House for more than 30 minutes on any subject. However, the mover of an original motion is allowed 45 minutes for his opening address. Also, the House or a committee of the whole House may at any time move a motion to extend the speaker's time sufficient for them to complete the presentation if the individual fails to complete within the stated time. And that's what's on the agenda. It should be noted, though, that elements of the day's agenda can be changed or moved. Before we go, here are a few things you should bear in mind if you plan to attend a session at Gordon House. No visitor shall create any act of disorder within the precincts of the house. No visitor shall be admitted to the house without first obtaining an admission card. Visitors who remain within the precincts of the house during suspension of the session are asked to keep silent. No photography, videography, or sketching of the proceedings is allowed unless so authorized by the presiding officer. And there should be no smoking inside the parliamentary building. It's almost time to go to the main event, but before that, let's get the answer to the trivia question. We asked, true or false, any Commonwealth citizen 21 years or older who has been domiciled in Jamaica for the 12 months preceding an election may become a member of the House of Representatives if elected. It's true. In fact, among those who may not become members of the legislature are members of the Defense Force, persons serving a foreign government, judges of the Supreme Court or Court of Appeal, and persons holding or acting in public offices. Here are a few more interesting facts about the Houses of Parliament. The Speaker of the House is responsible for administering the oath of office to the members of the House of Representatives, giving members permission to speak on the House floor, designating members to speak, and counting and declaring all votes and more. The Speaker is the most visible and authoritative spokesperson for the majority party in the House. The Speaker navigates legislative rules and procedures that's necessary to overcome the difficulty of managing a large legislative body like the House of Representatives. The Speaker rarely takes part in a debate. The Speaker of the House is formally elected by members of the House of Representatives from among their number at the first sitting after each general election or when there is a vacancy. Although the Speaker is usually a member of the ruling party, a minority party member may be chosen. Marissa Colleen Dalrymple Philibert is a Jamaican attorney at law and politician representing the Jamaica Labour Party, JLP. She is the 15th current Speaker of the House of Representatives. Stay with us. The proceedings will begin in a few moments. I was unable to attend the funeral of the sister of one of our longest serving members of parliament and faithful to this party and to this country, the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, the Honorable Desmond Mackenzie, lost his sister and she was laid to rest on Saturday last. We want to 
mourn with him and to express our sincere condolences, my personal condolences to the minister, because it doesn't matter how we expect it, whatever happens, when it comes, it's final, and it is a time where we need to recognize and to support each other. So, Minister, I want, on behalf of all of us as members, to express to you and your family our deepest condolences. And I would expect that as members, after Parliament, we can show our sympathies to the Minister. And please be reminded also that it's really a peculiar time because once again, Minister Warmington, who, like Minister Mackenzie, is a long-serving, hard-working person who has served this party, who has served this country, lost his sister. And we want to share in this time of deep sorrow and to let both ministers know that our hearts, though our presence might not have been there, our hearts are with them and their families at this time. Because, you know, one, you have it at the funeral and you're sad, but the real sadness comes when all the arrangements are over and it's finished and you're left with the reality of the loss yourself. So my condolences on behalf of all of us to both members of this house. Um, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker? Yes. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I'd like to express my personal condolences uh, to Minister Warmington for the loss of his sister. Ms. Minister Warmington is a real family man and he cherishes dearly every single member of his family. And when they pass, he usually, uh, I should say, he celebrates their lives. And he does not hesitate to say to everyone, this is a family member of whom I was very proud and I wish to celebrate, come and share with me. So Minister Warmington, I'm sorry I was not around to share with you but my condolences goes out to you and the entire family. Minister Mackenzie, I must tell you, Madam Speaker, Minister Mackenzie and I, we grew up together. Of course, I'm a little older than he is. And um, his sister, Beverly, was someone who I admired, was close to, and appreciated her whole demeanor and how she cared for people. I was sorry that I was not here to be at the funeral because for me, it's family. And so, Minister, I want to express my regrets that I wasn't here to share with you and again to say how sad I am and I mourn with you for Beverly's passing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me, on behalf of the opposition um, extend the condolences to both ministers and the passing and both members and the passing of their loved ones um, and to say to you that explicitly that those of us who are not a part of that party also supports um, the minister members in their grieving um, and we give our condolences thanks and on a more pleasant note, I want to welcome all of, this, all of the persons um, sitting with us this afternoon in the gallery and also to everyone who joins us on Zoom, our students and all members of the public who will join with us in this evening's session of Parliament. Statements by ministers. Announcements. Oh. 
bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers, reports from committees, notices of motions given orally. Dr. You have permission, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move the following motion. Whereas crime affects all Jamaican men, women, and children, and whereas persons accused of specific crimes often leave their communities and relocate to new communities where they are relatively unknown to residents, and whereas Jamaicans, particularly the citizens of Eastern St. Thomas, have expressed concern about the ease with which these accused persons move across the island with impunity, and whereas there have been numerous instances of accused persons who have absconded bail and their locations remain unknown, and whereas there has been documentation of persons who have committed further offenses while out on bail and the entire country attempted to locate them, and whereas the fear induced by accused persons being on the run has resulted in cases of mistaken identity which may have led to the death of innocent persons, and whereas there has been chronic overcrowding in the nation's prison, in many cases due to the presence of numerous detained persons who qualify for bail pending their trials but are unable to afford the bail offers, and whereas Jamaica spends an exorbitant amount of money to provide for the basic needs of persons who are in state's custody, and whereas the technology does exist to electronically monitor the whereabouts of these accused persons, and whereas electronic monitoring has been defined as monitoring with an electronic monitoring device that is not removed from a person's body, that is utilized by the supervising agency in conjunction with a web-based computer system that actively monitors, identifies, tracks, and records a person's location at least once every minute, 24 hours a day, and whereas electronic monitoring can be used to alleviate the overcrowding in prisons by targeting persons who may qualify for bail but are unable to pay the directed sums, or persons being released on bail for certain violent crimes such as rape or murder or may pose a flight risk. And whereas the technology can also be utilized to electronically monitor persons out on parole or to institute home confinement as an option for sentencing where appropriate. And whereas the Department of Correction Services has previously undertaken an electronic monitoring pilot project. And whereas there is a need to improve the technological infrastructure to support the establishment of an island-wide electronic monitoring program. And whereas all parliamentarians in this honorable house have an obligation to ensure the safety of all citizens of Jamaica, be it resolved that this honorable house implore the government to take the necessary steps to establish the infrastructure needed to implement electronic monitoring for accused persons and other persons as may be identified. And be it further resolved that this honorable house implores the government of Jamaica to prioritize this initiative as a matter of great national importance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and answers to questions. Motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motions relating to sittings of the House. Motions for leave to introduce bills. Presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtained public business. Madam Speaker. Today, it is our intention to continue the sectoral debate, and the presentation today will be made by the Honorable Delroy Chuck, Queen's Counsel, 
MP, Minister of Justice, and he will be our only speaker. But just before Minister Chuck um, makes his presentation, I'd just like to thank Minister Chuck for acting as House Leader and Minister Malahu Ford for acting as Deputy House Leader. <laughs> I thank them very much, and they did an excellent job because I monitored via the internet. So, Madam Speaker, Minister Chuck at this time. Yes. Minister Chuck. That I be permitted to speak from a seat other than my own. Madam Speaker, I begin by firstly congratulating you for the excellent work you have been doing as Speaker of the House, <laughs> along with your deputy who, when you're absent, she also does a wonderful job. <laughs> we also, Madam Speaker, would like to thank the Clerk of Parliament, Ms. Curtis, and I see that she now has a wonderful assistant and also all our members of staff who have done extremely well over the years. And certainly they have assisted all of us members of parliament, especially ministers, in discharge of our duties. Madam Speaker, in what continues to be challenging times for our nation and the world by extension, I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to report on the achievements of the Ministry of Justice in this my seventh consecutive year as Minister of Justice. It is also with immense sense of pride that I highlight the privilege of appearing in this honourable house on behalf of the constituents of North East St. Andrew, serving as a Member of Parliament for 25 years. To the Prime Minister, I am very thankful for his confidence in my ability to continue the drive of access to justice for a better Jamaica. As we build on the pillars towards a reformed and improved justice sector. To my hardworking team at the Ministry of Justice, thank you. I acknowledge the Acting Permanent Secretary, Mrs. Grace Ann Stuart McFarlane, for taking on the Herculean task of ensuring that the plans and policies towards a reformed justice sector are met. The task, Madam Speaker, is in no way an easy one, and without the Minister's team, the advancement in the justice sector could not be achieved. I would say, Madam Speaker, most of the members present here are heads of departments from the Ministry of Justice. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the judiciary, under the sterling guidance of the Chief Justice, the Honourable Mr. Justice Brian Sykes, and the staff of the Court Administration Division are critical partners in the drive towards a first-class justice system. The partnership is one rooted in mutual respect and commitment to build a more resilient sector. The judiciary and the court system have my full support as we work together to provide a justice system that Jamaicans can be proud of. And I say, Madam Speaker, special thanks to the President of the Court of Appeal, the Honorable Mr. Justice Patrick Brooks, the Appeal Court judges and the Court of Appeal staff, the Supreme Court and Parish Court judges and their staff for their fulsome support of the Chief Justice and the Ministry of Justice to make our justice system the best in the Caribbean. I also would like to thank Madam Speaker, the Attorney General, previous Attorney General, my good friend, now Minister Mal Martin Malalu Ford, and the present Attorney General, Ms. Dr. Derek McCoy, my good friend, the Solicitor General, Mrs. Marlene Aldred and her staff, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Ms. Paula Loylin and her staff, the Director, Court Administration Division, Mrs. Trisha Cameron Anglin and her staff for their ongoing contributions. 
Madam Speaker, heartfelt thanks also to the various teams in the affiliated agencies and departments of the Ministry of Justice, including the Administrator General, Mrs. Lona Brown, I see her at the front, and her staff for protecting the interests of minors, creditors, and beneficiaries of estates, and the Executive Director of the Legal Aid Council, Mrs. Diane Watts, I think she's there in the stand at the back there, and her staff, uh, Mrs. Karen Campbell Basco, the head of the Justice Training Institute, and her staff. Madam Speaker, there are so many who have given support to the Ministry of Justice, the custodies, the Justice of the Peace, all who have helped the past year for us to have a wonderful year. Madam Speaker, towards the end of 2021-2022 fiscal year, the Prime Minister, the Most Honourable Andrew Holness, in an effort to place renewed focus on constitutional reform and its attendant matters, shifted some departments to the newly created Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. These departments are the Office of the Parliamentary Council, the Legal Reform Department and the Law Revision Secretariat. I think also then, Madam Speaker, I would certainly want to thank those departments, Ms. Judith Grant, the Chief Parliamentary Counsel and her staff, the Director of Legal Reform, Ms. Nadine Wilkins and her staff, as well as the staff of the Law Revision Secretariat for contributing to the development of a robust legislative framework. As I have indicated, Madam Speaker, I have already thanked the Minister of Legal, Constitution and Legal Affairs for her contribution when she was Attorney General. Also, special thanks, Madam Speaker, to former head of the Victim Services Division, Reverend Osborne Bailey, who has proceeded on pre-retirement leave following his years of dedicated service and commitment. I also acknowledge, Madam Speaker, the support of our stakeholders towards the justice reform program. Special thanks to the delegation of the European Union of Jama to Jamaica, Global Affairs Canada, the United States Agency for International Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Section in the United States Embassy, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, for their continued support of the justice sector strategic objectives. Madam Speaker, to my personal team, Close Protection Officer Sergeant Howard Hamilton, my driver, Mr. O'Neill Ennis, heartfelt thanks. I'm also grateful, Madam Speaker, to my two councils and constituency support staff who assist in my duties and ensuring a sixth consecutive term as Member of Parliament. Madam Speaker, last and by no means least, I owe a debt of gratitude to my wife, Patricia, and all our family members for being there as I undertake my duties as Minister of Justice and Member of Parliament. My deepest gratitude to all of you. Madam Speaker, I begin by looking at the court operations. As I reflect on the activities of the past year, I begin with highlights on the operation of the courts. Most of us, Madam Speaker, would be aware by now that the pandemic, though challenging, presented an opportunity for the courts to adjust operations to meet the demands of the public. This saw the introduction of electronic filing at the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, which meant, Madam Speaker, that attorneys and litigants could file documents with the respective registries, even with extended lockdowns and periods when the courts could only offer reduced services. The Judicial Case Management System, JCMS, which is currently in pilot in selected courts, has assisted in this effort as documents filed electronically were uploaded to the JCMS to allow for ease of access to the records and facilitate the progression of the cases in a timely manner. The shift to the virtual space, Madam Speaker, also included virtual hearings in most courts. In the Court of Appeal, most, if not all, matters were heard virtually. 
This is a rich experience for att some attorneys, that, or most attorneys, some of whom appreciate the time and cost saved in making their presentation from their homes, offices, or other convenient locations. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I don't think he minds in saying, I can use his name, Walter Scott QC, said he has done so many more cases in a comfortable manner from his study, and he has now negotiated with his wife to use one bedroom to be his office, where he can really participate in court and make his presentations from this bedroom, properly attired, but in shorts and slippers. <laughs> so, when the judges see him, Madam Speaker, they actually believe that, you know, he's fully dressed and, uh, you know, the, anyone looking on, the various um, persons who are on Wi-Fi, see him well attired. But he tells me, Madam Speaker, he's in his slippers and shorts. <laughs> but he has his gown on and can participate from his home. So, Madam Speaker, may I say that we want to expand it. Equipment to facilitate virtual hearings is available in most courtrooms at the Supreme Court, and the technology is now being replicated in other courtrooms across the island. I expect, Madam Speaker, by the end of this fiscal year, each parish court should be able to conduct virtual hearings. In addition to this, Madam Speaker, we expect that the backlog in cases should be significantly reduced, even though we recognize that there's a constraint in terms of transcript being available, and we're working assiduously on that, Madam Speaker, and that the issue of transcript will shortly be dealt with effectively, so that in the Court of Appeal, within the next few months, the transcript will become available. And Madam Speaker, the Court of Appeal at that level has been doing a fantastic job. During the past year, they had judgments delivered for 268 cases over the period April 2021 to March 2022. 268 judgments, cases. The judgment delivery rate, Madam Speaker, was 172%. Since 2018, there have been 163 judgments delivered for every 100 judgments reserved, producing a judgments clearance rate of 163%. What I can say, Madam Speaker, is that we have been able not only to outfit the Court of Appeal fully, but we have, because they now have offices, all 12 plus the President, we are now able to appoint all 13 judges. The effect of that, Madam Speaker, is that we hope that the backlog of cases in the Court of Appeal will be significantly reduced over the next few years. And when I wrap up at the end, I will give some suggestions to the Court, if they don't mind, as to how the matters can be speedily dealt with. Madam Speaker, in the Supreme Court, there is much concern regarding the inordinate delays in matters being completed from the time of filing or when the matter begins. Let me first indicate, however, Madam Speaker, that in non-trial matters such as probate, divorces, and chamber matters, including hearings before the mass and chambers, there has been a significant reduction in the time to process and to complete. So, Madam Speaker, in divorce cases, the average time to have a divorce done has been reduced significantly to 20 months. So, Madam Speaker, many divorces during the past year have been completed within 16 weeks, many divorces. But the average time, because some extend, have been is 20 months. Now this, Madam Speaker, 
is a significant reduction to the three years and more in the past. But the reason, Madam Speaker, and lawyers should be aware of this, why it continues beyond the six weeks which is possible, is that there are so many requisitions. The attorneys, especially the younger ones, have not properly provided the material necessary to complete the probate and the divorces. So you find, Madam Speaker, that a lot of requisitions take place. So if the divorce or the probate document is properly completed, it can be dealt with within three months. But the real challenge is the requisition that the attorneys, especially the young attorneys, they keep sending them back. And then once it is returned, it's another three to six months. And young attorneys, if they just ask the various clerks in the courts for some assistance, some guidance, but they feel they know it. <laughs> and so they just do what they think and send it back to the court, and the court frequently have to send it back. So in these two matters, Madam Speaker, we are now, yes, at 16 months average for probate, 20 months for divorces, quick, once everything is completed, within three months they can be dealt with. So we are asking attorneys, please ensure that your documents are properly completed before they are filed. Moreover, Madam Speaker, probate and matrimonial matters are expected to be processed at a faster pace following the establishment by the Chief Justice of the Family and Probate Division of the Supreme Court in September 2021. The Family and Probate Division is equipped with dedicated judges and there has been operational reform in these registries which, will anticipate, which we anticipate will, will result in speedily delivery of probates and divorces. Madam Speaker, work continues towards reducing backlog in the courts. A case is continued, considered to be in a state of backlog after being in the court system for over two years without being disposed of. Madam Speaker, we are doing well in the parish courts. Most matters in the parish courts are now being completed within 12 months. And, uh, Madam Speaker, this is a major accomplishment of the judiciary. We have situations where for the past number of years, Madam Speaker, most of the parishes are completing more cases than are actually being filed. So that in most of the parishes, for every 100 cases that actually come, that actually are filed, more than 100 cases are actually cleared up, in other words, completed. The three, three parishes in particular, Madam Speaker, must get some commendation, Westmoreland, Portland, and Manchester. They are now doing in excess of 116%. Westmoreland is at 124%. So in other words, for every 100 cases that come into Westmoreland, 124 cases are actually completed by the judges in Westmoreland. Madam Speaker, this is important to note and to congratulate the parish courts for the tremendous job they're doing in ensuring that matters are dealt with expeditiously. The Chief Justice hopes that by within a matter of another couple of years, that all matters coming into the parish courts can be dealt with within 12 months, which would be fantastic. Justice in such cases, Madam Speaker, would be delivered and dispensed in a very professional and timely manner. So, Madam Speaker, where we have a problem is in the Supreme Court, where in trial matters, so that in the civil cases, Madam Speaker, cases are now being put for trial 
in 2027, 2028, and it won't be long before they go for 2029. Madam Speaker, this is embarrassing. The truth of the matter is that the Chief Justice is determined to have trial date certainty. So once a trial date has been put and the number of time, days that is, will be required to complete it, no more cases will be put in that court. Madam Speaker, for cases to drag on for five, six years is not giving the right impression if we are going to really be competitive in the modern world. And so, Madam Speaker, it is something that we have to deal with because when matters are put for trial, five years plus, in all sincerity, is a lose-lose situation. Neither party wins. And that is why, Madam Speaker, and I will address it some more, that the government and the ministry is promoting mediation as a strong alternative and encouraging litigants and attorneys to use mediation, Madam Speaker, which is a win-win situation. I will address this much more later, Madam Speaker. This strategy will also ensure that matters can be settled within a reasonable time, and as a result, only difficult and complex matters need to be tried by the courts, and hopefully within three years. Madam Speaker, in criminal cases, matters are taking too long. When a man is charged and it goes beyond five years, I think it's fair to say, Madam Speaker, that the man's constitutional rights for a timely resolution of his case, that his constitutional rights are called into question. So we need, Madam Speaker, to find ways and means to complete these cases within three years. There's no shortage, Madam Speaker, of courts, which was a challenge in previous years. But then again, many are underutilized. There's no shortage of judges, Madam Speaker, because we have increased the complement of judges in the Supreme Court. So the real question, Madam Speaker, is to put the files together and to get matters tried in a reasonable manner. But moreover, Madam Speaker, I still believe that we need to use the Plea Negotiations and Agreements Act more. Regrettably, this act has earned an unnecessary bad image as it is seen as operating just when an accused pleads guilty, which is clearly not the case. The act, as its name reflects, involves negotiation and agreement in which the accused is invited to plead guilty in consideration of an appropriate sentence to be negotiated between the prosecution and defense and approved and sanctioned by the trial judge. In most cases, it involves a lesser sentence than would normally be imposed if the matter had gone to trial and a guilty verdict was found. But in appropriate cases, even if the defense attorney seeks a reduced sentence, the judge could still impose the maximum sentence as a sentence that fits the nature and gravity of the crime. That's a problem. However, Madam Speaker, what is important is that at least in the sentencing process, the prosecutor plays a role and both the aggravating and mitigating factors are examined and where possible, the victim or the victim's family and friends are consulted. This is how plea bargaining operates, Madam Speaker, in the United States. Across states and federal courts, over 90% of the cases are completed by plea bargaining. In some states, less than 5% of the criminal cases are actually tried. So plea bargaining cases must be distinguished from what presently occurs. In most cases where they are accused without any prompting from the prosecution, pleads guilty and expects to benefit by up to 50% of the normal sentence as provided for in the Criminal Justice Administration Act. That is what generally occurs. 
In these matters, the prosecution, prosecution rarely have an opportunity to provide the arguments in support of the final sentence, Madam Speaker, which is one of the reasons why the Minister has now provided the opportunity for the prosecution to appeal sentences which are considered too lenient. Madam Speaker, it is a matter which I will discuss more with not only attorneys, but also with the DPP. When one comes to trial, if the case is very strong, then why are you going and wasting the court time? Negotiate a sentence, you take off a bit of the, the length, you reduce the length. If the case is very weak, Madam Speaker, sure, the accused must be tried. If the accused feels that he has a good chance, he will insist on a trial. But oftentimes, as happened in the United States, you bargain. The prosecution and the defense can bargain because the case is not that strong. If, it's, if it has no foundation, it should be dismissed. But if it is not a very strong case and it could go either way, Madam Speaker, then the prosecution and the defense can indeed discuss what appropriate sentence is possible. The problem, Madam Speaker, especially with the parish court, that can be done, but then you need to get the guidance of the DPP in negotiation. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, we are now looking at unification to bring the clerks into, under the DPP so that plea bargaining will then come under the DPP, even in the parish courts. We're getting, you know, in the parish courts in criminal cases, even though, as I indicated earlier, that a lot of cases are being tried, Madam Speaker, the problem is that more cases are coming across most of the parishes, especially in the criminal cases. The average for the last five years is 27,400. But last year, the total number of criminal cases crept up to 31,000, which is 4,000 more than the average, Madam Speaker, which indicates that more criminal cases are coming to these, these courts. Admittedly. But the truth of it, Madam Speaker, and I will discuss it shortly, even in the criminal courts, we need to use alternate justice services such as child diversion, restorative justice, and in the civil cases, more mediation. Madam Speaker, what will aid in the disposal of cases is the effective use of technology. As we promote access to justice for better Jamaica, it is important that all players within the justice system use the technology necessary to propel us to first world standards. This minister, Madam Speaker, understand that in some cases, justice delayed is justice denied. To this end, we continue to make significant contributions and improvements to the operation of the courts by investing in the tools and infrastructure that support the use of technology. So, Madam Speaker, the court's capacity for virtual hearings, for example, has been strengthened. This is evidence, for example, in the Supreme Court, where only 12.5% of civil hearings held in 2021 were conducted in person. 64.2% were done by video conferencing, and the remaining 23.4% were done via teleconference. This is an important innovation, Madam Speaker, that will help to ensure that cases are dealt with without parties have to use bus fare, taxis, and security vehicles to come to this court. In the last fiscal year, Madam Speaker, we handed over two mobile units to the judiciary to allow for remote testimonies. These buses, Madam Speaker, valued at over 34 million, have been fully equipped with audiovisual equipment and the other state-of-the-art features. The equipment facilitates witness testimonies over secured connection with compatible equipment installed in courtrooms across the island. Additionally, Madam Speaker, improvements have been made to court connectivity as the Ministry partnered with the National Works Agency 
to install fiber optic cables at court locations island-wide in an effort to strengthen the communication between the courts. Fiber optic cables were installed in at least eight courts in the corporate era, which bolstered the court's capability for sharing a high volume of information securely and provides leverage to other services over the connection. This partnership has been expanded to cover the parish courts across the island at a cost of $27 million. And I'm sure, Madam Speaker, in Trelawney, they will tell you the internet service is working well in the courts and across most of the other parishes. This improved internet allowed the judiciary to have stable internet connection to facilitate communication with adult and juvenile remand centers across the country. This allowed mentioned matters to be heard virtually, removing the need for persons to appear in person for these brief matters. It also allowed the judiciary to facilitate litigants overseas having matter, their matters heard during the travel restrictions necessitated as a part of the pandemic response. The Manchester Family Court was also provided with audiovisual equipment valued at, at approximately $11 million. We also installed a range of security and safety technology to virtually facilitate vulnerable witnesses. Madam Speaker, during the 2021 fiscal year, the Court Administration Division also began the process of implementing the Government Financial Management Software, GFMS, as part of steps being taken to address financial risk areas in the courts. Madam Speaker, this is important. The courts are responsible for the collection of significant sums of government revenue, and the judiciary has a duty to take deliberate steps to safeguard the stream of revenue. Madam Speaker, we also provided a legislative production management system, which will allow the ministries, departments, and agencies to submit their legislation electronically to the Office of the Parliamentary Council and will improve the efficiency of the legislative program. My good friend, Minister Marlene Mollaloo Fort, will benefit from this technology in terms of the output of legislative uh, program. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Minister also spent a significant sum of money, $720 million, last year to improve a number of courts, not only Manchester, but also the St. Anne Family Court, which will shortly, Madam Speaker, be opened. That family court in St. Anne will shortly be opened to serve the northern part of Jamaica. So, Madam Speaker, we are especially proud of the addition of these two family courts, which will strengthen our services to families as we work towards increasing access to justice for a better Jamaica. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we are also working to improve the facilities at the DPP so that all the prosecutors can better able to discharge their obligations and functions. I must admit, Madam Speaker, the work at the DPP has been delayed, but we hope that during the month of May, it will be completed. The delay was caused because the generator, as you know, Madam Speaker, took a long time. I mean, you know, any sort of transport on the high seas were held up over the last past year and so. But the new generator is now here, and we are hoping that it will be connected and the transformer so that the Court of Appeal building and the DPP will have backup um, generator in case anything, the, the um, GPS should malfunction. Madam Speaker, we have also done a number of refurbishing and repairs to uh, several courthouses. And Madam Speaker, this is a continuing work. Because, Madam Speaker, the truth of the matter, even though most of the courts are over 100 years, we can't re build, rebuild all of these courts. So those courts, Madam Speaker, we are, we are not going to build new courts. And I will explain shortly, we will build, try to get at least five new parish courts. The others will have to be, meant, they will have to be brought up to a standard. And my position, Madam Speaker, is that we must bring the courts up to first world standards, so that when people go to the courts, they see a court that is iconic. 
that they feel that they can get justice done properly in attractive communities with excellent amenities. And that is my view, Madam Speaker, that we must improve the facilities in the courts so that the staff who work there and the, our, the public that uses these courts, that they feel that they can get justice in appropriate surroundings. Madam Speaker, we had the um, Brownstone Court burnt down last year. We have been able to work with the Minister of Local Government and the Parish Council to use Addison Park, which is now being renovated so that the Brownstone Court will be used it hopefully for a couple of years because we want to rebuild the Brownstone Court which was burnt down. So Madam Speaker, apart from that, we have several justice centers that we want to complete. But once again, Madam Speaker, the procurement, the procurement, the procurement <laughs> is causing some delay in getting these justice centers built. We were very fortunate, Madam Speaker, to be able to put in place two restorative justice centers during the past year. One in Greenwich Town, where I opened it with my good friend, Member Angela Brown Burke, lovely facilities we improved for you, and also with the Minister of um, Finance in Pembroke Hall, two wonderful facilities that will be able to this be facilities for the citizens in the surrounding areas to use to get some form of alternate justice. Madam Speaker. Members of this Honourable House will be aware that I recently launched a public education campaign to take justice to the people of Jamaica. I intend, Madam Speaker, to visit each parish, to appeal to and to encourage citizens to utilise the services of the Ministry of Justice to settle their differences and to have justice done in every nook and cranny of our island. Members should also be aware that there are justice centres in each parish. In addition, there are nine additional restorative justice centers, a number of victim service division offices. In every parish, there's a victim service office, child diversion offices, and shortly, we'll put mediation centers in many of the parishes. We have also partnered, Madam Speaker, with the Dispute Resolution Foundation to deliver mediation services to those who can't afford it. Those who can pay will pay and have mediation. But those who cannot pay, the Ministry of Justice will facilitate these litigants to have mediation done. Later, Madam Speaker, I will share more about this partnership. These facilities and services are available. However, they are not fully utilized, hence the campaign that I have embarked on, Madam Speaker. Because the truth of the matter is, our people need to use these alternate victim services. As a people, Madam Speaker, many of us have not yet learned to settle our disagreements without resorting to abuses, fights, physical attacks, and sadly, shootings and killings. And I say, Madam Speaker, we need to go out, every member of parliament, the churches, the schools, the communities, to encourage persons in disputes and in conflicts to settle their matters in an amicable way. Many serious crimes, Madam Speaker, emerge from simple disputes and disagreements which could have been easily cleared up if the parties were referred to a restorative justice facilitator, a mediator, or a counsel to assist them in reaching an amicable settlement. Madam Speaker, the Ministry is therefore determined to urge students, parents, families, neighbours and residents in our schools, communities, churches and other institutions to avoid actions and to settle their matters using these services, which in most instances, Madam Speaker, are being offered free. Our crime and murder rate will not be reduced significantly, Madam Speaker, unless our citizens can find lawful, legitimate and appropriate means to diffuse disagreements and conflicts. This is where, Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Justice alternative dispute resolution measures have been responded. And only yesterday, Madam Speaker, 
Minister Williams and I signed a memorandum of understanding for us to promote restorative justice in all the schools. We are starting out in the next two months with 104 schools, but we intend to that all the schools, the New Testament Church of God, have begged they want us to train their 200 pastors in restorative justice. The Seventh-day Adventist Church want to partner with us to promote restorative justice. So the churches are coming on because, as you, I will explain to you, they see the benefit of restorative justice. Madam Speaker, the practice of restorative justice is not new and has been very successful in many countries across the world. It was introduced in Jamaica in 2012 and has been promoted in a limited way since then and given some impetus in legislation since 2017. However, it is only in the past three or four years that the practice of restorative justice has gained momentum. For example, restorative justice has played an effective role in criminal and family matters. Where the parties, Madam Speaker, have been referred to restorative justice facilitators, the success rate, Madam Speaker, is in excess of 90%. Once the parties agree to go to restorative justice and a facilitator, members of the family, the community, assist them, 90% success rate. So admittedly, Madam Speaker, in criminal cases, the matters referred are simple misdemeanors where the parties are well known to each other and restorative justice has been an important tool in successfully restoring their relationship. Madam Speaker, we have met with all the parish court judges and many of them are referring inappropriate cases in the criminal courts, the matters to restorative justice. Madam Speaker, the Minister's mission is to get warring families and communities to utilize restorative justice. The emotional benefits have proven to be incalculable when the parties in conflict are able to work out their differences. In many cases, the settlements, Madam Speaker, bring hugs, relief and tears. You'd be amazed, Madam Speaker, when people explain to you how they have restored their relationship, how they hug up one another, and each party crying on the shoulders of one another. Cheers. Madam Speaker, I pause here to share the testimonial of a pastor's family. This is a bishop, Madam Speaker, who benefited from the restorative justice program. Will you hold it back and then we do it later. Madam Speaker, I move to mediation. Mediation is a useful tool to set the disputes and conflicts, but as I mentioned, underutilized, and therefore, as indicated earlier, the Ministry will also be promoting the use of mediation to help avoid litigation with the Ministry's campaign to have more matters in the courts referred to mediation. We have also gone a step further, Madam Speaker, and have requested and received funds to promote mediation. The funds have been used to support a pilot project in collaboration with the Dispute Resolution Foundation. During the pilot, lit litigants who are unable to pay the mediators can, access, can still access mediation. Payment to the mediator will be made by the Ministry through the application of a means test similar to that applied by legal aid services. And Madam Speaker, we, during the pilot project, four months between December the 1st and the end of March, the success rate of mediation was 82%. I mean, when you have something like that, you ask the question, why is it not being used more? And these are cases referred by the courts to the mediators. 
and only 17, 18% of cases the parties after the trial could not settle, so they were returned to the court for settlement. So, Madam Speaker, if we know that mediation has worked, is working, and can work, and we will be ramping up the promotion of mediation right across the island. Madam Speaker, 50% of the cases referred by the court or 50% coming out of the community, if they can be settled, it is a benefit to everybody. Yeah. And therefore, Madam Speaker, we are urging more litigants, potentially litigants, to try to use mediation rather than to litigate. As I mentioned earlier, mediation is a win-win situation. Trial brings relief to one side, but pain and hurt to the other. And the loser frequently feels there's no justice. And so there's an increase of cases, Madam Speaker, from the parish courts and many courts to appeal because the loser feel that they need to have the matters dealt with. Madam Speaker, I now ask that the standing orders be suspended to enable the minister to continue his speech to its conclusion, notwithstanding the time limit on speeches. Members, the question before the House is that the minister be given sufficient time to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Minister Chuck. So, Madam Speaker, thanks. Thank you very much, colleagues. Madam Speaker and colleagues, I certainly won't abuse the time. I hope we will finish in due soon. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, when cases are tried, there's a winner and a loser. And sometimes both parties lose. With mediation, the parties control the process they can decide what they give and what they take. And frequently, both sides are happy. A relationship can be maintained. And therefore, Madam Speaker, we will be urging litigants and attorneys to really use mediation. Madam Speaker, the ministry intends to go beyond mediation in the courts and to urge parties and attorneys to access the service of the DRF or their mediators in the parishes to mediate even before they file a court action. Parties in dispute can visit the justice centers, the victim service offices, or the DRF, or Madam Speaker, call toll free Triple Eight Justice, which is Madam Speaker's Triple Eight Five Eight Seven Eight Four Two Three. But I deliberately spoke with the relevant authorities and got this number, Triple Eight Justice. And Madam Speaker, these we will be circulating, urging everyone to really use mediation rather than litigating. A lot more can be accomplished if parties could just use mediation and the burden on the courts would be significantly reduced. So Madam Speaker, as we proceed with mediation, that is what we mean when we say access to justice for better Jamaica. Madam Speaker, we also have child diversion. And child diversion, Madam Speaker, came about when the Act was passed in 2018 and we've begun official implementation of the child diversion program in March 2020. Madam Speaker, over the past just under two years, 333 referrals, that is the court, or the police, but mainly the court, that have a child 12 to 17, who has committed a criminal offence, if it is not really serious, the court is encouraged and the court does refer these matters to a child diversion officer. Madam Speaker, of the 333 referrals, 305, 92% of them, Madam Speaker, have been completed satisfactorily. And this is why, Madam Speaker, in many parishes, the courts are now appreciating that child diversion should be utilized as more and I think in this fiscal year the child diversion officer is asking for more assistance in terms of staff because a number more cases are being referred to them. Not only that Madam Speaker we trained 30 mentors mainly justice of the peace in every parish 
30 in every parish who are available to mentor these youngsters who may get into trouble. To support these children, Madam Speaker, we signed 25 partnership agreements for services such as counseling and psychoeducational assessment. This included the Memorandum of Understanding with the National Council on Drug Abuse and the Women's Centre of Jamaica. As addressing the needs of these children requires a multifaceted approach. However, there is much more we can do and we want to widen the referral system so that families, schools and communities can refer children at risk of committing an offence. At present, the Act provides that those suspected, those charged and those convicted of committing an offence can be offered mentorship and counselling. These are services, Madam Speaker, the Child Diversion Officers presently offer to those who are referred by the courts and the police. By this approach, we can help these youngsters to avoid delinquent and criminal behaviour. Madam Speaker, as can be seen, improving access to justice also includes those most vulnerable in our society. I will be promoting again, Madam Speaker, the use of child diversion so that our youngsters, whether they're in schools or in the communities, who are going astray, that they can get mentoring and counselling. Because, Madam Speaker, these youngsters are our future. And if we don't really assist them at this age, then you will appreciate they may well end up in the penal institutions at a later time. So, Madam Speaker, when we promote child diversion, we are speaking about the access to justice for a better Jamaica. Madam Speaker, I know the impact of crime is often severe and devastating for victims. And so the Minister of Justice continues to encourage them to seek counselling at a parish victim service office, where a counsellor can assist them in processing their hurt and anger. These victims, Madam Speaker, are encouraged to avoid the route of retaliation and reprisal, which so often are the emotional responses of victims of crimes. Madam Speaker, the importance of the work of the Victim Services Division must be emphasized, as at a time when Jamaica is increasingly seeing disturbing acts of violence, the, div the division is delivering critical support to those who are affected. The figures, Madam Speaker, show that these Victim Service Officers are doing yeoman service, counseling thousands of victims and also assisting them to avoid reprisal and retaliation. Not only adults, Madam Speaker, but also young children. Madam Speaker, we have not stopped there. The Victim Services Division has been creative in developing an arsenal of tools to address the sometimes complex needs of those it serves. They have included resources like an animation bundle to assist in helping our children understand some of the most sensitive issues affecting them. The animation bundle comprises eight short films that provide critical lessons to help children cope with violence and life-changing trauma. Another innovation, Madam Speaker, introduced by the division during the onset of the pandemic is its e-counseling service, which facilitates the use of audiovisual communication, such as video conferencing, and virtual meeting rooms to offer real-time therapy and consultations. During the last financial year, the division added 35 new e-counseling stations to strengthen that initiative and was able to conduct 9,786 e-counseling sessions through that medium. I think, Madam Speaker, they deserve commendation. Madam Speaker, this facility is an important way of serving the members of our communities, but also rely on justices of the peace who are community leaders. Madam Speaker, we, as you know and everyone knows, I promote the justices of the peace across Jamaica. And we have really commissioned quite a number of them. These JPs, Madam Speaker, serve the communities, the rural communities in particular, in a tremendous way. Many pensioners, many unemployed, many persons depend on the JPs for these services. I do not deny, Madam Speaker, that there are few JPs who have gone astray. 
because they have been taught, they have been sensitized that they are not to charge. But you do have a few, less than 1%, Madam Speaker, who take advantage of the contact and use, provide service and are charging. It is actually unlawful. The Act 2018, just of the Peace Act, prohibits the charging for any GP service. Madam Speaker, we will be promoting, we will be promoting the parish associations right across. Every parish will have a parish association, and that parish association, the member, the member, basically, all members, all JPs, are members of the parish association. And this parish association of all JPs will now become self-regulating to ensure that JPs across the island are regularly contacted, are in touch with one another, those who are going astray, that they can be brought back into the fold. Because yes, the numbers do go astray, but the parish associations hopefully will be utilized so that they can be in regular touch with all the JPs. But moreover, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Justice want to be able to be in touch with all the JPs because we have several sensitization sessions throughout the year. And Madam Speaker, we have now asked all the GPs across the island to send in their annual report. And the annual report, Madam Speaker, is really to get the updated information about the GPs. Usually they are addressed, their contact numbers. But we want, Madam Speaker, to give every GP an email. So we have put in place at the Ministry of Justice, the necessary web development so that we can get all GPs with an email. So that that will be the contact for the GP when persons around the island would like to contact them in the community to, to be able to get in touch with them. So we don't have to give the address or the cell number of the JP. They have an email address that the citizens who want to contact them can utilize. This venture, Madam Speaker, costs us $5 million, but we really want all the JPs to be able to have an email so the Ministry of Justice can be in constant touch with them and they can also be in touch with the Ministry and with the custodians in all the parishes. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, we have just under 4,000 GPs who have not really filed their reports. And most of these GPs are really in the parishes of Kingston and St. Andrew, St. Catherine and St. James. And all we want, Madam Speaker, is for these GPs to just send in a one-page annual report so we have all the contact information. Madam Speaker, we are working on this and we hope that the GPs can continue to offer the excellent services that they have provided over the decades. Madam Speaker, an important justice service which have been delivered to Jamaica is the expungement of certain criminal convictions for those who meet the qualifying requirements. Members will appreciate that the principle underlying the process is that a person who has made a sincere and successful attempt to be law-abiding should be given the opportunity of a first time. Madam Speaker, we have been working to improve the efficiency of this process and during the last fiscal year, 93% of applications for expungement were processed and submitted to the Criminal Records Office within five days of receiving the applications. Madam Speaker, there's a lot of complaints about the time it takes, but the truth is the fact that you apply for expungement doesn't mean you automatically get it. What is important, Madam Speaker, is that we get the records from the Criminal Records Office. And Minister Chang is not here, but he and I regularly talk, how can we improve the efficiency of the Criminal Records Office? They are coming under tremendous pressure, Madam Speaker, the Criminal Records Office. Everybody wants a criminal record, even if they have no criminal records, they still have to go there and get a report. And that is what is holding up a lot of the expungement takes too long. So, you know, a person has applied for expungement. We send in the request. They pay for it, you know. And we send it to the Criminal Records Office. And it had taken six months and more. 
And the people complain that it is the Ministry of Justice that is holding the... We Madam Speaker, we, the panel, the expungement panel, meets almost every week because of the cases. Once we get it, they will meet and the matters are considered and we are appropriate. The, the, it is expunged. Madam Speaker, we are trying to clear this up, but I would just like to send a message that we... I have a cabinet submission which is on the consideration by cabinet. We are looking at how we can ensure that more cases, especially for inappropriate cases, can be expunged. And Madam Speaker, that is a matter which I will return in terms of expanding expungement. Because Madam Speaker, there are many cases that have been refused expungement. The truth of the matter is that many of them 20, 30 years ago. And when it comes to the expungement committee and to me, because it can't be expunged, you really say these are matters which really deserve consideration. And I know, Madam Speaker, there are so many that have come on appeal, and because they are not expungible, and because the Act won't allow it, they are refused. So, Madam Speaker, this is an area which we hope to address in short order. Madam Speaker, the Ministry also provides marriage licenses. And we process, Madam Speaker, 8,630 applications, most of which were from the tourists, the hotels. The 3,490 of them came from the hotels, 5,140 from walking customers. And Madam Speaker, once they come to the Ministry of Justice at 601 Constant Spring Road, in 24 hours, they get their license, the marriage license. And Madam Speaker, I'm happy to report that the ministry has collected 34,520,000 in the past year and for the consolidated fund. So, Madam Speaker, we are providing quite a bit of revenue to our government. Madam Speaker, the Just Justice Training Institute has been doing a fantastic job in to provide training for non-legal professionals in the sector including persons working in the courts, the justice centers, those also in alternative dispute resolution services, as well as lay magistrates and many justices of the peace. Madam Speaker, the Institute has demonstrated agility in carrying out its functions, including shifting to virtual delivery of its programs during the pandemic. Madam Speaker, during 2021-22, 13, sorry, 1,334 justices of the peace were trained and also those who were newly qualified. Madam Speaker, this agency is doing a fantastic job. The other area, Madam Speaker, two other years I must touch on, is the Administrator General's Department, and not because the Administrator is here, I will say this, but the Administrator General is doing a fantastic job in ensuring that matters the estates are dealt with speedily that they are dealt with in a timely manner. So, Madam Speaker, the Administrator General transferred assets to beneficiaries and closed 425 estates in the past year. Over the past, last 10 years, the Department closed a total of 5,600 cases, Madam Speaker. While a total, I mean, that's a fantastic amount of work. While 3,470 new cases were taken on. This resulted in a net reduction of 2,130 cases. Over 4,000 backlog estates were included in the closures. Over the past two years, Madam Speaker, the Department has trained and developed a team of specialist attorneys at law who are assigned to a designated unit task with the responsibility of administering backlog estates. Madam Speaker, in an effort to improve service delivery since 2015, the Department has been issuing its own instruments of administration, and in, within the past six years, the, the Department has issued 1,550 instruments at a yearly average of 260, and in average time, Madam Speaker, of three months, for you to get a letter of administration within three months is fantastic. So, Madam Speaker, this is allowing the execution and responsibilities of the Department to maintain minor beneficiaries where funds are available. 
Madam Speaker, the AG, the Administrative Department, continues to modernize its operations. And Madam Speaker, their system, Trust and Estate Management System, the TEMS, TEMS, helped to digitize 90% of the manual files and records. This year, 99% of the estate files are fully scanned and now accessible to multiple users facilitating remote and real-time access. Madam Speaker, also 90% estate accounts are now fully automated, allowing for real-time statement of accounts. So, Madam Speaker, let me assure Jamaicans that they can always be in touch with the Administrator General Department. They have gone, Madam Speaker, with us to sensitize not only JPs but communities that they must make a will. How to make a will. But if a person has died without a will, how to be in touch with the Administrator General Department and I would say the Executive Director, Mrs. Lona Brown and her staff have been doing an excellent work in ensuring that the people of Jamaica are well served. Madam Speaker, the Legal Aid Council has been doing, uh, Legal Aid Council, Madam Speaker, you know the Constitution provides where persons tried or for a criminal offence that they are entitled to proper legal representation. I can say, Madam Speaker, that we have been able to provide legal aid to virtually, not only due to counsel for persons who have to give a statement at the police stations, but also to persons who can't afford an attorney in the courts. I am pleased to report that over the past year, the council facilitated a total of 4,753 legal aid assignments. Of that number, 2,282 were due to council assignments, and 2,471 matters were disposed of. Additionally, Madam Speaker, the council continues to serve the most vulnerable, and 33 persons who were deemed mentally challenged were assigned attorneys. Madam Speaker, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution continues to do its excellent and sterling work. Truth of the matter, Madam Speaker, is that the cases have mounted and are increasing. Despite, Madam Speaker, the obvious challenge of this office, the Office of the DPP managed to dispose of 672 cases in the rural circuit courts. This, Madam Speaker, 68 more than the 604 cases projected for disposal in the period. 242 cases were disposed of in the Western Regional Gun Court, which put them ahead of the 224 cases projected for disposal in that court. In addition, Madam Speaker, a total of 145 cases were disposed of in the rural circuit courts as against a projection of 148 cases for the period. In the Home Circuit Court, 177 of the projected 282 cases were disposed of. Madam Speaker, the Attorney General, sorry, the DPP is definitely burdened by the number of criminal cases, but we are, they are trying to ensure that they are dealt with in a timely manner. The Attorney General's Chambers, Madam Speaker, I just highlight a few aspects of the legal work of the Attorney General's Chambers and the progress in respect to the centralization of legal services. Members will recall that the move towards centralization of legal ser services follows a cabinet decision in 2017 giving approval for legal services to the government of Jamaica to be centralized on a strengthened and restructured AGC. At the time, the central concern, Madam Speaker, was determination that the AGC workload was not sustainable and current business processes would need to be re-engineered re for greater efficiency. There were concerns relating to the reputational risk to the Attorney General's Chambers as only the most urgent files were being addressed within the context of ever-increasing backlog. I am happy to report, Madam Speaker, that the process of centralization is progressing with the Chambers actively undertaking the recruitment of staff with a focus to fill new and some existing positions, especially in the legal services units. This will allow, Madam Speaker, for the phase onboarding of all staff to the Chambers in the coming months. Madam Speaker, 
The Attorney General's chambers have been not only understaffed, it cannot attract really outstanding um, attorneys, but we are trying. They have moved twice over the past two months because of air quality where they were, but they are now settled at Hillcrest um, Avenue. And so anyone who wants to get in touch with the Attorney General's chambers will need to deal with them at Hillcrest Avenue. Madam Speaker, I turn now, we have dealt with the achievements over the past year. But I spend a few minutes, Madam Speaker, to indicate what are the projections for 2020, 22-23. Madam Speaker, the Chief Justice and I meet regularly. And one of the areas that I really we touch on is how best to see how can we get timelines for all the processes within the various areas of the ju judicial system or the justice system. In truth, Madam Speaker, we want that no case should go beyond five years at any sector. And certainly, Madam Speaker, we hope in another few years that or certainly in this fiscal year, most of the matters can be dealt with within three to four years, and none should be over five years. But we know that, you know, some will. But we are hoping that the older cases can be dealt with. In the past course, Madam Speaker, the Chief Justice has said within a, by 2025, all cases should be dealt with within 24 hour, uh, months, and we're hoping that can be achieved. So, Madam Speaker, these are areas which we will be assisting through mediation and plea bargaining. So, Madam Speaker, mediation, we're hoping to really push hard in the parish courts so that these cases can be expedited and therefore the backlog can be dealt with speedily. And also, Madam Speaker, that the cases can be tried and dealt with more expeditiously. But, Madam Speaker, in the Supreme Court, as I said, the cases are now being put for five years. I plan, Madam Speaker, to introduce something new. And this is something new for attorneys and litigants. Cases that have been put from now to 2028. We are going to invite the litigants to engage, Madam Speaker, in what I call and what is well known as RB Med arbitration mediation, or MED-ARB, mediation arbitration. At one time, Madam Speaker, when I became Minister of Justice, I thought of employing retired judges to try cases. It hasn't worked out. There are many problems in doing so. But I have been in discussion, Madam Speaker, with many retired judges who will be happy to assist in this new venture that I hope to bring on stream. I have had discussions with the Minister of finance, and I will bring it to cabinet soon, and discussion with the Chief Justice. This is just to say to the litigants, if you are prepared, your case has been set for trial, but if you are prepared to use MEDAR, that is, you come before one of the retired judges who will be sensitized in MEDAR, and after you use mediation to try to settle your matter. And when you fail to set your matters, then you each put forward your best case. And the judge, who is then a mediator, stroke arbitrator, will make a final decision. So the litigants whose cases have been put down for trial, if they're so minded, can get one of the retired judges who will be on the program to determine their case, to adjudicate. And they will then have the opportunity, firstly, with mediation, to see if they can reach an agreement. Where they can't reach an agreement, they then leave it to that retired judge, who is well experienced in most cases, to make the final decision. But the parties will consent that that final decision will be enforceable. So, Madam Speaker, it is something that I know has been tried very well, especially in Singapore where a lot of these cases are dealt with very quickly. And th that is the way, Madam Speaker, how we hope to really 
remove many of these civil cases from the list. And this, Madam Speaker, I hope to put in place shortly after the summer, after I've had fulsome discussion. Madam Speaker, the infrastructure, we want to build five new parish courts and a Supreme Court. The Chief Justice, the Minister of Finance and myself met with DBJ and relevant stakeholders and the Minister of Finance has indicated that these courts, Manchester, St. Anne, Trelawney, St. James and St. Catherine, that we must do them by PPP, public-private sector partnership. So, Madam Speaker, over the next few months, the DBJ will be putting out the format where the private sector can indicate their interest to build a parish court. And they, at that point, will put a proposal. How I understand the PPP works, Madam Speaker, they will put a proposal, but then it has to be advertised so others can actually bid. And the one who bid the lowest or the best will get the contract. But I hope, Madam Speaker, before the end of this fiscal year, we will have enough private sector persons who will indicate that they are willing to participate in this PPP and we can get at least these five parish courts to be built, plus a new Supreme Court, Madam Speaker, where the old Attorney General Chambers used to be. Madam Speaker, my final point, my final point, and, the, and I should have it now, is the mediation to show how restorative justice was so effective. I wonder if we can get it now. Are you ready now with that clip? restorative justice and I can tell you now today I had a serious problem in my family at one stage and we were referred to restorative justice and I can tell you now today my son and myself we are the closest closest we have ever been we are so close that he called me almost every day so I want to promote minister and I'm asking you, sir, please, if you can put some resources, more resources, to promote this thing high and wide. I am a beneficiary of it, and I can tell you, you have some excellent staff. You have some excellent staff, and they take us from nowhere to somewhere. And today, I can tell you, I am rejoicing. My family is together, and I am really, really happy. I'm a happy person. God bless you. Madam, Madam Speaker, this is the bishop of a church who came and made that presentation in Restorative Justice Week. And he has asked us you can promote it because he has been a real beneficiary. Madam Speaker, my final point. I want the courts to start moving towards a paperless court. Yes. Madam Speaker, you know it when you go around the courts. The amount of documents, files, if you put them all together, Madam Speaker, and sell them to the cement factory or to one of the cane industry, you could, they could generate electricity for at least three months. <laughs> at least three months, Madam Speaker, if you burn all the paper. But before we do that, Madam Speaker, we want to digitize all the records and those which are really important and the original documents are important, the archives, Jamaica archives, will keep them. So all of that is under the Chief Justice. And I'm happy to report, Madam Speaker, that the Inter-American Development Bank would like to help us with this. And just to indicate to you, PM, they have invited the Chief Justice, myself, and others to visit a European country to see how the paperless system works. And we're hoping they have promised, and I will bring you Prime Minister, up to date. They want us to see it because they want, I've asked them, and they want us to see it if we can adopt it because, Prime Minister and colleagues, we want the courts to be electronic and to move all the papers out of the courts. So, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Justice is playing its role in the governance of this country. I know a lot more needs to be done, and we at the Minister of Justice 
We're up to the task. We will do even more. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I now ask that the Madam Speaker, I now ask that the sectoral debate be suspended. The question before the House um, is that the sectoral debate be suspended until a date to be announced. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I now ask for the recommittal of item statements by ministers where the Honorable Carl Samuda, OJ, CD, MP, Minister of Labor and Social Security to make a statement. Members, the question before the House is that the item on the agenda statements be recommitted to allow the Honorable Minister, Mr. Carl Samuda, to make a statement. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Uh, Minister Samuda, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The House will recall that in my presentation earlier, I had indicated when asked the question as to what was going to be the plan put in action in respect of what we call the um, special allocation for short-term poverty intervention. And I indicated that at the earliest possible date, I would bring back to this House notification of what our final decision is. Well, Madam Speaker, I am taking the opportunity today to advise uh, that instead of the customary um, allocations of a certain amount every six months or every three months, the decision was taken that we would allocate the full year's allocation from now. And over the period of the next few months, each member of parliament can choose how they wish to identify the recipients, but they can be assured that um, we will be monitoring the situation at the level of the social workers to ensure that the program runs as usual quite smoothly. So um, we are effectively immediately placing at the disposal of every member of parliament $1.5 million towards this particular uh, activity. That is an, and, and I think that it is a period when people are in need. And so we felt that instead of delaying it, that we would do it as we are uh, in a position so to do. Um, Madam Speaker, I also want to take the opportunity. By this, a number of M members of parliament, you would have heard me say that we are digitizing the ministry. So we are not sending out hard copy for notification with respect to the overseas employment program. So many of you, if you look at your email, would have seen that the numbers were sent out today as to what we are allocating for every member of parliament. And um, you may proceed to make recommendations as you did previously. All the applications, all the recommendations that were made previously <coughs> are now, as we speak, being processed, being assessed by a team from Canada and also through the assistance of RADA to um, conduct these interviews and make the assessment and the recommendations for persons who you, as us all, have been recommending to the ministry for consideration in being able to join the Overseas Employment Program to both the United States and Canada. The allocations, as I said, have been made to each member of parliament. I must add, though, 
that when we analyze the extent to which members of parliament have made recommendations far in excess of those that are successful in the final examination, I am imploring every member of parliament to convene small meetings and to make an assessment as to the um, likely success of a candidate that is going to be put forward as your recommended candidate to go overseas. One of the major considerations that the examiners are going to be looking for is this question of the increasing incidence of AWOL that is taking place. A number of, a number of persons, unfortunately, are using this opportunity once arriving in both Canada and the United States, and especially in parts of Canada where it is increasing and very worrisome because it will ultimately affect the entire program because the authorities of, in Canada have already contacted us with a view to holding discussions to see what can be done to at least reduce the incidence of persons um, leaving employment and just simply disappearing in the country. So in making your recommendations, I'm asking every member of parliament to be very mindful of that. And it's not just a question of doing a constituent a favor. The favor you grant a constituent who is likely to not return to Jamaica will do more damage to this program than anything imaginable. So I ask that you pay particular attention to this exercise and I certainly, based on the information available to me, which comes to me on a regular basis, we are seeing a very substantial increase in demand for our workers. And it was only recently that we were told that the owners of farms have a distinct preference for Jamaican workers. Unfortunately, we are disappointed when we hear things like persons uh, leaving the farms and not returning. And we try our best to select the best, and we certainly realize the importance of it to the people of Jamaica, because the funds that are earned, over 85% of those funds are returned to Jamaica in hard currency. And they go far away in alleviating the hardships in each family, sending children to school, uh, providing for the necessities of life at home while they go overseas in foreign lands to earn the hard currency that is so badly needed in Jamaica. So I thought, and I thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for permitting me to make this short statement today to advise the House that in keeping with our policy of trying to um, honor commitments made when we make speeches in this honorable House, um, that it is taken in that light. So thank you very much. Madam Can Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, just one, uh, maybe two, just very quick question around that. Thanks for the information and for following up on your word. Um, just today, a couple of persons would have called and come to my office with some um, concerns. One I think I raised with you earlier, which is that in between the processing and a call that we would have gotten, when members of the public go to the office, they invariably are sent to their members of parliament in, in, and, out of, in, in and out of season. And, and I think that for the recruitment, yeah, for the original recruitment of the program. And I think sometimes they actually don't believe us when we tell them that we would have gotten a form already, we would have made a call, we would have submitted, and that there's now nothing that we can do. Um, I have mentioned it before, I mentioned it, I think, to the um, previous minister as well. I think you have to find a way of ensuring that that kind of information about the program is 
um, given out in a way that does not suggest that members of parliament um, have the information and should be doing that. That's one. The second one, um, Minister, is that I am assuming, knowing you and um, knowing, I'm assuming that knowing you, that in the processing that it is being done in an open and transparent manner, the number of persons who are asked which MP sends you is a problem. It, it, no, it is a problem. Now, you might say that if you're asked who sent you and you give a name and you are sent on to the next phase, it's okay. But when you're asked which MP sends you, as the last question before being told that you fail, fail the program, it becomes a problem. We are in a low trust environment. Persons are looking at how um, government programs are administered. And we are seeing people developing um, a view that who sends you is, um, plays a big role in who gets placed on the program. And I, no, I just, I, I want colleagues to listen because listening is important. What I said is that the view is being developed because of the questions asked and how they are asked, and I believe it is an issue. Um, Ma'am, before, before you answer. Yeah, Minister, um, yeah. Minister, can I just, I want to bring to your attention a matter that I'm sure is the experience of most, if not all of us here, which is you would have, the, the, the program is seasonal, well, at least for the members of parliament, um, as I'm aware, they, the, the cards, so-called, card, what they call the cards, get, get issued, the, the, the card, as they call it, um, get issued, um, to, from, from my experience, once a year. In between that, a number of persons would have gone to the, the ministry, so they say, and ask, uh, or come to the, well, if, if, they come to the, if they come to my office, it's one thing. The problem is they go to the ministry, ask some questions, and the ministry tells them to come to the members of parliament as if, we, as if they, they, are, they, they are aware that we have ticket um, presently to give. And, and, and when you say to them that you do not have any ticket because it's whatever you've had would have been issued. No recruitment. They, and no recruitment is taking place now. There's a certain disbelief about that. And I believe that that can be remedied if, look, sometimes you have to make allowance for the fact that they will fabricate, individuals will fabricate stories, sometimes. But it is so widespread that I'm of the view that it is not an individual. It is a systemic issue. And I believe some conversation should be had with the ministry staff as a whole to really tell them to... <laughs> and for once, for, for once you find some agreement, huh? <laughs> all, right. all right, all right. No, but, but, but seriously, this has been a long-running concern. And I believe the time has come for some kind of conversation to be had within the ministry with the staff to say they know the program, they know how it's administered, and they should not set up members of parliament and put them in a position where... This is the first time I've done this, the first time. <laughs> where, where, where they're made to defend, having to be constantly defending themselves. I think we need to address that problem. Well, members, all that you have said have actually, those discussions have been held in this house for almost as long as I have been here. The fact of the matter is, as I indicated, and here again I want to make it clear, that I don't come to this house and make a presentation to give an impression. 
Impressions don't matter to me anymore. What matters to me? What matters to me is whether what I say is honored. And if I cannot honor it, I don't utter it. Now, let me indicate and remind you that when I got the ministry, um, when I became the minister, I indicated that we were going to change the method of allocating farm work opportunities. I call them farm work opportunities. Yeah. I abhor the use of the name farm work card. And as a consequence, I've eliminated it. So you will not get a request via a farm work card to hand out. What you are asked to do, you have no authority to appoint anyone. There's no member of parliament in here, including myself, that can appoint a person to be part of the program. What we can do is make recommendations. The program is managed by a very efficient team at the ministry, and all elements of doubt have been removed from this question of preferential treatment. It is not likely that any such accusation can be successful against the present method of doing it. Firstly, when a person is interviewed at the constituency office, it is not fair for you to say to the applicant that you don't get no card to give out. So you really can't be held responsible. You are held responsible to the amount that you are allocated to recommend. And in this instance, I can tell you, because many of you, if you look in your email, you will see your allocation. The majority of you are allocated 50 persons to make applications uh, to recommend to, from each constituency. 50. I want to also point out that the recommendations that you make must be seen against the demand. We don't create the demand. The demand for farm workers under the H2B, which is the agricultural sector, is created by the demand of the farmers overseas, not us. If we don't get requests, we can't send people. So what happens now is that when, we, when I got there and I examined the list, and this is very important to understand, when I examined the list and I asked, I couldn't bother go back into years, but I asked for a list of all persons who traveled in the financial year March Third, uh, April 1st to March 31st, 2022. So all of last year, I have them all listed, and those will be sent to you on request if you'd like to know all the persons from your constituency that traveled last year. When you get that, you will immediately observe that 80% of those who traveled last year, traveled the year before, and have been traveling in some instances for the last 15, 20 years. And so we have, we have made the decision, and that is an executive decision, and if, I, if it's wrong, I blame, you only have me to blame. I said, I could not in all good conscience regardless of who recommended the person, say to them, because the government has changed, you're no longer qualified to go overseas. So I said all persons who have qualified repeatedly should be allowed to continue the relationship that have been built up over the years between themselves and the owners of the farm. There's a case in point over 80 years of age, a person. And that person, when they travel, don't really do very much. But the farmer has been so accustomed to that person 
that the person has become like a member of the family. And under the program, he requests that person every year, and that person goes up, and most of the time, that person is there to keep the family company and to give encouragement and to work with the Jamaicans. So it is over years that these relationships have been built up. So 80% of those who will travel this year have traveled before. So we are only working with a market of 20%. And we must understand that. What I do by giving an allocation to you of 50 people to recommend is that we go... Minister, Minister, just, just a moment. Just a moment, just a moment. Madam Speaker, I, I, the Minister, I listened, I thought I heard him say 50 a while ago. I, he just repeated it. And I just need, wish to say to him that I have never gotten 50 cards. I've gotten 20. I've gotten 20. And that is not true. Whoever is grumbling something just don't... You don't know the facts. So keep quiet. So I've never gotten 50. I've gotten 20. And I, you know, I, I'm just saying, Minister, I have never gotten, and I believe it is the case, and you may want to confirm, that members from urban constituencies are given small, a smaller number. That needs to be said. I wouldn't like the, the information to go abroad that I get 50, when in fact I've only gotten 20. Huh? Okay, okay. Well, if the, word, if the word goes out that you have been sent a request to recommend 50 people, and you said, yes, you'll be telling the truth. Because that is what you have been allocated. And, well, oh, no, just keep quiet a little now. What has been sent out by email today precedes my presentation because I don't bring big brown paper bags full of cards for you. That's not my style. I do it digitally. This is a new era. Minister. So you have I'm gotten an allocation of 50. Now go and recommend 50 good people and they will all work. <laughs> oh, Minister, it just really needs just have clarity, huh? because I hope everybody's listening. I don't think so, but some are listening. Minister, what, all, I, all I'm trying to do is to really bring to you a situation that needs some clarity. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm sim in fact, I believe you're doing a, a marvelous job, if you ask me. But the point is, there are these issues that are there that need clarification. So I'm saying, upon, if you tell me that as of now, I will be getting to recommend 50. Huh? No, no I, I'm hearing me. I will, I will, I will. But the point needs to be made. Up until today, that this new email has been sent, where I'm asked to recommend 50, I, on, on every occasion previously, I've been asked to recommend 20. So if that has changed, and I've been asked to recommend 50, I welcome it. But I think it needs to be clarified, lest my constituents think that I have been receiving 50 previously all along, and I am telling them I have been receiving 20. That's important. Well, what we are doing is we are demystifying this whole entire program. Right? Now, what is the purpose of giving you 50 when, based on the history of this program, you are not likely to have more than perhaps Half of those qualify. Now, we must, and our strategy to ensure that we address the thing on a timely basis. We can't wait until the people ask us. It's like having a, a store and you sell rice. And it's when the rice finish 
that you're looking for a scoop to sell somebody. You have to replenish your stock. So we have to maintain what I call a travel-ready pool of workers. So that when the request comes, we are ready to have them processed quickly, get their visa, and within two weeks, they're on a plane. Now, we can't tell the overseas farmers that, I'm sorry, but we are delayed because we have to go get some people to interview and send. We must have a travel-ready pool. And I've told the ministry that they are to communicate with the members of parliament and advise them as to exactly who from their constituency comprise the pool. So you will know who is on call. Right, you saw them today. There you go. So you, and it's a transparent thing. And it doesn't only apply to MPs, by the way, you know, the church members, private sector, trade unions. A lot of people are asked to submit councillors and so on, to submit recommendations. Because we want to step up the activities in the farm work program overseas. We want to increase that by this year at least 20% over what it is now. And the only way we are going to do that is to show I was in the States last week, I had discussions. And one of the little delays that it was, we asked the, 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 the farm worker to go and find the money to pay the fee. So they line up down Duke Street at the bank to get a draft to pay the American um, embassy the fee. That's a holdup. So what we are working on now is for the agent in the States, and in this case there is one agent in America that has about 80% of the business, to upfront the fee, because the fees were paid by the farmer. So when the worker paid, they go overseas, and the farmer will refund them. So the arrangement we are working on now is for the agent here in Jamaica, or in Miami, but with an agent in Jamaica, to upfront the fee so there's no time spent. And there's no demand for the worker to go and find 30, and now it's going to increase to about $50,000 in order to get a chance to go. Those are changes that we are making. And as the changes are made, every member of parliament will be advised because we have no secrecy in how the process operates. There is no preferential. When we are to choose, we have a large pool, and we are to choose from that pool. It is done by computer random selection. Random. After we have satisfied all those who have gone abroad before, we then have this pool, and within reason, where each constituency is weighted and so on, and it's selected randomly. So everybody has an even chance. So that is how the program will go forward. So please, um, read your mind of the bogey days and try to think of the more progressive action that is being taken going forward. Madam Speaker, may I ask that the item notice of motion given orally be recommitted? Members, the question of the item, notices of motions given orally be recommitted. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move the following motion. Whereas it is stipulated in the standing orders of the House of Representatives, in particular Order No. 32A1, that the time allotted for sectoral debates shall be two days per week, being Tuesdays and Wednesdays, over a period of six weeks in each year, and whereas this year's sectoral debate commenced on the fifth day of April 2020, and the stated period will therefore elapse within the week beginning the ninth day of May 2020, 
be it resolved that this Honorable House approve the suspension of the standing orders to enable this year's sectoral debate to continue beyond the stipulated deadline. Madam Speaker, I beg to give further notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take this motion. Those against, the ayes have it. No, 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 no. Madam Speaker, it is not contemplated for us to do further business today. <laughs> Madam Speaker, um, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion, notice of which I gave earlier, and so the member's disappointment can be um, reduced since we will be here a little longer. The question is that the standing orders be suspended to enable the minister to take the motion, notice of which she gave earlier. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The motion has been approved. Madam Speaker, I now move that the motion, notice of which I gave earlier, be approved. So, um, members, the question is that the motion, notice of which the minister gave notice earlier, be approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thanks to the honourable members of the House. And notwithstanding the disappointment of the member across the aisles, Madam Speaker, it is not contemplated for us to do any further business today. And I therefore ask that the House now be adjourned until Tuesday, May 10, 2022. The question before the House is that the House do adjourn until the 10th of May, 10th of May, 2022. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. This honorable house is now adjourned. are screaming, wondering how they can stretch their dollar. Can